It was one of the most daring Allied missions of World War II. Six men in three kayaks take on the might of the Japanese Empire. The mission is shrouded in secrecy. Discovery means death. Now, 70 years later, a group of men will attempt to recreate that journey, pushing themselves to their limits and braving whatever nature can hurl at them. They have but one goal, to follow in the footsteps of Operation JWIC. It is September 1943. The Empire of Japan is one of the largest maritime empires in history. It covers over 7 million square kilometers, stretching from Burma in the west to the Solomon Islands in the east. And at the height of World War II, Japan threatens to expand even further. It was a time when Australia and Australians feared that the Japanese were actually going to invade. The previous year, three Japanese midget submarines had attacked Sydney Harbour, had come right into the harbour unseen. There had been shelling of Newcastle, there'd been shelling of Sydney, Darwin was bombed. Then, one night, seven Japanese ships in Singapore Harbour are attacked in a mysterious act of sabotage. The man behind this stunning operation, a British military officer named Ivan Lyon, Spurred on by the humiliation of Singapore's surrender to the Japanese, Lion and a team of hitmen sail 3,000 kilometers from Australia to the Riau Archipelago before paddling the last five nights in folding kayaks into the enemy-infested waters of Singapore Harbor. Their aim? Revenge. To those outside the small group of believers, this was absolutely mad. JWIC operatives uh, had a personal investment in JWIC in that uh, they had uh, family that were either interned or POWs uh, of the Japanese. Uh, they had no understanding of whether those, that family was alive or dead. As Lion and his team of five creep alongside Japanese vessels in their kayaks, they attach limpet mines to the ship's hulls before disappearing into the night extremely well trained, extremely brave on what many said was going to be a suicide mission at that point in time. Uh, bravery is something that is hard to describe with someone like Ivan Lyon. Incredible. On the 70th anniversary of Operation JWIC, four men have decided to recreate those last five days to raise money for charity. They'll be retracing the original route kayaking from Panjang Island into Singapore, a journey of about 100 kilometers. On the way, they'll be sleeping rough and living on a minuscule amount of rations. The training uh, for JWIC enabled them to uh, not just prepare the skill, necessary skills and, and competencies of, of the operators, uh, but they did full-scale rehearsals. I thought that'd at least be like a, like a solid like, base. Yeah, like a skeleton of a, of a boat. I think the pump, you mean the nozzle? The nozzle. But so, they still may actually have instructions for. Yeah. I think, to be honest, if you just try each one and see if it works, basically. Pretty embarrassing that over four months uh, of us preparing uh, and ready for this moment, uh, and it came to a simpler thing as having to blow it up like you'd blow up an inflatable in a pool, and we couldn't really get our heads around that. So, yeah, humbling uh, in many ways. Weeks before the expedition is due to start, the four men have just acquired inflatable kayaks meant to carry them 100 kilometers across the sea. So what are we doing wrong exactly? Because we're... You need to play with the nipple, man. Yeah, this way. Yeah. No, they look like they're the ones you used to use when you were like a kid in the swimming pools. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they used to break all the time. That sound is a sound I don't want to hear. <laughs> we're just not experienced enough. We don't really know what we're doing, and this is the, the sum of what happens. I didn't realise they were actually going to be dinghies. I thought they were going to be plastic kayaks. So. How is that comfortable? It is. I'm actually amazed how comfortable it, it is. I sat in it, just 
that and it feels what does that feel stable? It feels a nice snug. Months before the original Operation Jaywick, Lyon and his team had gone through a grueling training regime in Australia. They had been trained in stealth, endurance, hand-to-hand -hand combat, weapons and explosives handling, and the use of magnetic mines capable of blowing up tens of thousands of tons worth of ships. These four couldn't even blow up their own boats. With the deadline for the expedition drawing near, the team goes in search of new members to make up for their lack of skills. Their first find is ex-England rugby player James Forrester. As a gym owner, his involvement will give the men a place to train. But the real catch is Christian Zott. In his current incarnation, he's the unassuming owner of a logistics company. But in a previous life, as military in a, in a special force, a combination of mountain and marine, climbing, diving, swimming, jumping out of helicopters, this is what I did. I think Ivan Lyon was certainly a military man and I think he could see right through from the beginning to the end of how this operation might be done. And that's the important thing about Operation Jaywick. Half of this is uh, out of strength in the, in the arms. The other thing is, uh, do you have the right brain for this? Do you go for it? And uh, are you able to, to cover pain? Yeah, I made it very clear for guys that uh, I think there's two big sides to this challenge. One's putting it together and getting the boats, getting the sponsorship and things like that. But the other big, big part of it is actually the fitness. My name's George Rippon. My name's Daniel Clark. My name's uh, Daniel Morad. My name is James Rotherham. I'm uh, James Forrester. Well, my name is Christian Zott. With the team now complete, it's time to get serious about the expedition. Six men are planning to follow the route of one of World War II's covert missions, Operation Jaywick. It's a journey that will take three days of kayaking, exposed to the elements. The men's original plan was to use inflatable kayaks, but ex-Special Forces man Christian Zott has vetoed those as being unseaworthy. That sound is a sound I don't want to hear. And downright dangerous. Christian wastes no time getting some real kayaks together. The new kayaks, they are very fast and long. This is about five meters long. That is a boat. That's boat. The original kayaks used in the operation were made of black rubberized canvas stretched over a lightweight wooden and bamboo frame. They were collapsible, portable, and maneuverable. Viewed from the front, they would have been almost invisible. You have to have an engineering degree to put them together. Confidence is up, morale's up, everyone's enjoying it. As the team makes steady progress in their kayaking, they turn their attention to the issue of their route. As a naval operation, Operation Jaywick had to take into account tides and treacherous currents. A lightweight kayak could easily be swept off course. It wasn't a bunch of guys who got on an old boat and went up through the Lombok Strait and into Singapore Harbour. It was well and truly thought out and it took months and months and months in planning. Hey, how's it Dan? Are you good? Yes, yes. How are you? How are you? Oh, How are you? Thank you. Thank you. He told me that you have a project going on, which was kayaking around the area. Yes, we and need an expert. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll be sailing around for the last 13, 14 years. The team turns to a yachting expert for advice. Called Jörg, talked to us and to plan out the route to warn us of some of the danger areas and some of the problems we can encounter so we can plan and prepare for those uh, situations. One of the biggest obstacles you have is 
water is moving depending on the tides up and down. So what we have to do here is to make sure that we get the timing right. The tide can run up to four knots and four knots is just roughly eight kilometers an hour. When you're starting at one of the smaller islands uh, within the Rio group of islands called uh, Bula Panjan. So just for orientation, that's, that's where at the time the guys got into their kayaks and, uh, and started their way into Singapore. In the old days, it was all easy going here. Uh, now you're looking at the highway where about 30 or 40 percent of the world uh, material transport goes back and forth. Okay, so so those guys, they, they're making 30 knots, 40 knots. They're really fast. The big, big oil tanker won't see you guys, so it's just too dangerous. So we have to find a way how to cross this one without putting you guys into into danger. There are, there are three boats and six people. There are going to be times when, when of uncertainty when it's like, uh, uh, do we stop, do we not? Who makes that shout? Because we can't have six people with different opinions. The biggest skill set is Christian, and he's got the best uh, we've knowledge. We've got to stay within, you know, 100 metre radius of each other. And if one boat starts struggling, it doesn't matter if the best guy is saying, let's keep on going, we've got to, we've got to slow down. Yeah, and I think I think he'd know that yeah, personally. So. so I think we dedicate him as being the uh, our chief on the uh, on the water. He he understands it the best. With only a few days to go before the trip starts, training is in full swing. Ex Special Forces man Christian Zott has organized workouts, and everyone is turned up. Just not all of them at the gym. Trying to get James and George down to this gym is, um, yeah, pretty tricky. They were spending up to 18 hours a day training. They did nighttime training. They did extensive canoe training because that was the main point of Operation JWIC. So the training had to be intense. <laughs> it's the big day itself, when the team will attempt to recreate the last five days of Operation JWIC. A friend of the team has offered his motor launch to act as the support boat that will get them to their starting point, Panjang Island. From there, they will follow the original route as closely as possible. The key to Operation JWIC was the Krite, an old Japanese fishing boat still on display in the Australian National Maritime Museum. This was the boat that traveled 3,000 kilometers to get the commandos as close to Singapore as possible before releasing them in their kayaks for the final approach. You already had the boat, known as the Krite, which is a species of deadly Indian Asian sea snake. Um, perfect name for it, it was going to strike at the heart of the Japanese in Singapore. The Krite was already a war hero. Under the command of Australian civilian Bill Reynolds, she had saved over 1,500 lives by shuttling survivors to Sumatra during the evacuation of Singapore. There was absolute chaos at the docks, bombs were falling around the wharves, uh, there was mass panic and it, it resulted in the loss of life of a lot of people who escaped on those ships. In fact, um, it is estimated that uh, within that 24-hour period there were some 45 ships uh, that left that harbour um, and over 40 of those were sunk on the way down um, the Indonesian through the Indonesian islands. The Krite was one of the few that did make it out. And when Ivan Lyon met Bill Reynolds and saw how effective it was in evading Japanese bombers, the plan for Operation JWIC began to form. So of course at the time when Ivan Lyon and uh, Bill Reynolds got together, they brainstormed together and said if they can get this vessel out of these, these dangerous waters with, these, uh, with this indiscriminate bombing that was going on, with all these ships that were being sunk, if they could get the ship out, or they could damn well get it back in. 
and of course with the vessel being an old Japanese rundown fishing vessel, um, it blended in with the, the local fishing population. It was a vessel that didn't stand out um, and thus was perfect, perfect for that, uh, that sort of operation. The advice you've got at the moment is there is no current, no wind, nothing to get in your way. So it's in perfect condition. It does look like a long way compared to whenever we've trained, it's always the spots we hit yeah. always look quite close. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I was not built. It's the team's first day of a grueling 100 kilometer journey by kayak. Their attempt to recreate Operation Jaywick a covert World War II operation where six commandos snuck into Singapore Harbor and blew up Japanese ships. The original operation was carried out by six men led by Ivan Lyon. The other five were Wally Falls, Andy Houston, Arthur Jones, Donald Davidson, and Bob Page. They all paddled at night under the cover of darkness. Today, with the thought of crossing one of the world's busiest shipping lanes with sub-perfect navigational skills, the team have wisely opted to travel by day. They leave Panjung Island and they have to cover about 10 miles a day. The first paddle during the night with nothing to guide them, no navigational lights, it's pitch darkness, they reach the little island of Bulat. The team paddles from Panjung Island to Bulat Island exactly where the original group of commandos spent their first day. It's meant to be the place where the guy stayed so many years ago, so... James and Christian got here earlier. They've been here 40 minutes, that's how far ahead they were of them. Nothing to do with the fact that we're slow, clearly. Chop, chop, tent, come on. Just trying to... Come on, monkey butt, look. <laughs> Going forward, we'll stick together as a, as a team, but we made the decision because we're running a bit behind. Um, we'd maybe go a bit ahead of the other guys and um, you know, find a good spot to set up camp just in case we didn't beat, beat the, um, the light. Very peaceful. Thinking back to the guys 70 years ago. Whew. That's different, huh? As night falls, the wildlife starts to emerge, including one of the most venomous snakes on Earth, a krite, the namesake of the original ship that dropped off the members of Operation Jaywick. Can't even see the other island. Yeah, I don't know. It's incredible, really. It's, it wouldn't have been a bit of a double-edged sword, wouldn't they have to? You'd have to. You'd need the stars and the moon. Yeah, the stars. Yeah. So it's that, it would be there wouldn't be that that combined risk of you need that you need to you need to be able to see to go, but obviously then you can therefore be seen. The silence would have been a bit freaky as well. Yeah, and they're paddling out in complete and utter silence. Every sound you hear, you'd assume that you did, every sound you heard, you'd assume it was the Japanese. Yeah. Well, I guess that's the difference between us and them. Right? I mean, we, we are following the footsteps. We're seeing where they went, but they were doing it with the threat of death always close to them. Sleeping in those tents on this sandy floor, the thought of a snake creeping up on you, sleeping next door to Dan Clark, it's not a recipe for good night's sleep. Day two, and it's time to kick it up a notch. Today's the longest day we're going to be kayaking. It's eight hours. Uh, it's actually longer than they ever kayaked on one day. Uh, and as a result, we thought it was appropriate for us to, you know, try and ration out to what they had uh, and see how things go. 
This leg of the journey will take the team through the heart of the Real Archipelago, skipping between the islands from Bulat to Boyan, and then to Dongas and Subar, from which the original bombing raid was launched. During the original Operation Jaywick, this would have been deep within enemy territory. At this point, everything becomes very clear. They are really behind enemy lines. They have absolutely no idea whether they're going to be supported by the locals there or not, or they're going to be handed into the Japanese, so they have to stay out of their sight as well. The Riau Archipelago provided hundreds of anchorage points for major units of the Imperial Japanese Navy. Patrol boats in the area were a given, but Operation Jaywick had one big advantage. Not only had Ivan Lyon lived in Singapore before the war, he was an expert sailor and knew the islands like the back of his hand. They knew the islands, they knew the conditions, they were able to plan both where they could hide during the day, they knew which islands had water, which islands had particular food stores that they could use, so all that knowledge became absolutely invaluable in terms of planning Operation Jaywick. The plan is for everyone to stick together. To the uninitiated, every island looks the same, and it's far too easy to get lost. But with the rain, visibility has plummeted. The seas are rougher. And Dan Murad, who's got 100 kilos of George in the back, is falling far behind. Oh, there's a big wave coming. Six men are making a grueling 100-kilometer journey, tracing the path of the covert World War II mission, Operation Jaywick. Their aim this morning is to reach Boyan Island, where the members of the original operation would have started running into difficulties. This is a very difficult paddle. Two of the fall boats have collided. One is very hard to keep on track. <laughs> the first members of the team arrive on Boyan Island after four hours of paddling. Like several of the other small islands in the area, it's home to an isolated village. The parents or grandparents of these villagers may well have come within meters of the original Operation Jaywick. They arrive just before dawn too late to look for a decent place to hide. To their absolute horror, they discover they're only metres from a village. They hear people talking. They can't speak above a whisper for the whole day. They lie in the mud of the mangroves, eaten alive by mosquitoes and by sandflies. It is not until late afternoon that they're relieved from their torment by a tremendous tropical downpour which obliterates all sound and allows them to jump around and cavort and have a shower in the rain undetected by the villagers. Over two hours. Yeah, a bit longer than two hours, I suggest. Yeah. It depends, it depends who you're talking, if you're talking about the, uh, the other boat, maybe a little bit less. We're on Boyan Island, which is where the guys stayed the second night of the expedition. So we're essentially where they were 70 years ago, again, which is great. We're committed to go quicker at the second session. Isn't that right, Daniel? <laughs> I don't think we, we were trying to go slow in the first session. No, we weren't. No. <laughs> we're ahead of schedule, aren't we? Bang on, it's 12 o'clock. How long's the next leg? Four hours. Leon never ahead or back. Leon the present. Can you boys put some strobe lights on your boat? Because we don't even know where the you are. Seriously, when we, we got caught in that storm, we couldn't see anyone. We basically always go north straight out of this channel, so... Right. We can activate our back one. 
Yeah. You put those strobe things on that Hugh yeah. got. I'm not sure what your downside to having a strobe on is. Yeah. It's quite it's sensible to have on. We've got corned beef to look forward to in the evening. This is incredibly exciting. Uh, and we can have half of this ta uh, tin uh, between each pair kayaking. Uh, and that's all we get uh, for the whole day. For us trying to get used to uh, a day of surviving on what they survived on. Uh, and already it's uh, only been just past 12 and it's a struggle. The second leg of the journey that day is to Subar Island, where the original six launched their attacks on the Japanese ships. So on Dongus Island, they think they've got it ready to go and they set out, but the tide's against them. They just can't do it, so they go back. They have to find another island and they do, and that's Subar Island. Traveling under the cover of night, Lion and team had barely eight hours to paddle over, find their target, plant the mines, and get out. It would have been an impossible task if not for currents flowing eastward. Like wind behind a sail, it was these currents that propelled them towards their targets and then allowed them to escape to safety. When they're on Subar Island, they realize that they're going to run out of time pretty soon if they don't launch the attack. Run out of time because they have to be back at a certain time, 1st to 2nd of October, to be picked up to rendezvous with the Krite. So there were three boats on this operation. There are a lot of close shaves when this happens because they're in, an, they're in a port, basically, and it's an operational port. It doesn't close down at night. There are lights going, and there are also searchlights going just to make sure that nobody's coming into the harbour. There were operations going on on the wharves themselves. We've arrived here. It's their final item before they set off for their final attack. It's uh, special for us to be here now to have a look at, uh, you know, to be where they were and uh, get a feeling for what they felt like. In my head, I can imagine the boys being here. Yeah, this is the this is the first one I actually imagine them being on, putting their kayaks in there, climbing up the top. And they would have, right? I mean, they would have put their kayaks the there. They would have hidden them. It would have been the perfect place to hidden your kayak. Absolutely. Yeah. You could probably have a fire there if you're smart. So that's where they would have been 70 years ago today. Well, yeah, uh, hats off to them again. Um, they, they've beaten us as much as we try and follow in their footsteps. We seem to fail. It's uh, quite a humbling experience, this trip. Um, I think it's important for us to probably take a moment, a good minute to think about what those guys achieved and also really the bigger picture, to be honest. Um, the whole Second World War and this region really, the whole of Southeast Asia was very affected, Singapore in particular, and just bow our heads and think about a lot of the sacrifices and you know, a lot of the waste, sadly, that happened during uh, that conflict out here. After eight hours of non-stop kayaking, the team's day should be at an end but the island's terrain makes it impossible to pitch camp. There's no choice but to make the two-hour journey to Dongas, where the original six would have watched their minds go off. As the team nears the highlight of their journey, one of the kayaks starts falling behind again. Let me try it to this one. What was the first rule we had this morning, Django? What was it? What was it? What was it? We all said. No, that's not going to work, boys. Remember? Yeah. Stay together. Yeah. We, all, we all arrived together, didn't we? The whole point about this is you go as fast as the slowest boat, you try and stay together, you make sure you're with each other, and they weren't. And the first thing we said this morning was to stay as a group, especially if the weather got bad at one point, we couldn't even see the second boat. So it just starts to get irritating. We've just finally found ourselves on a pretty idyllic 
island actually after hours and hours and hours of kayaking monotonously through probably the only day since I've lived in Asia for seven years that it rained utterly non-stop uh, and it was fairly draining. Uh, we set off at eight uh, in the morning uh, and it's been a good 10 hour day and uh, we've now got to try and get ourselves together, get some uh, hammocks up, get some uh, tents up, then look forward to half a can of Spam um, and then bed, and it all begins again tomorrow. So uh, if you can just let us get on with this, it'd be, uh, it'd be massively appreciated. It's been a hell of a long day. The team has only had a few hours sleep when another disaster hits. The team's journey is almost at an end. They've arrived on Dongus Island, where the original members of Operation Jaywick escaped after planting their mines. But exploring the island will have to wait till morning. And we got all merrily to bed after a lovely fire, safe from the knowledge that we were right at the tree line. And then uh, I got a rude awakening when I could hear the water, uh, and when it came out, I realized that it was basically about an inch away from my tent, um, coming in rapidly, and then it was, it was the rain it was just started to hit. Ominous black clouds and the stars had vanished, and we could no longer see Singapore, so a storm was pretty much over the top of us. We went from sort of zero to 100 miles an hour. Christian and James moved their tent, and then the film crew had to move their tent on top of the kayaks as well. But uh, it's still very early, we've got a very long few hours until daylight when we can assess what's going to happen for the rest of the trip, to be honest. And here is where that branch is. Yeah, that used to actually be a sand ledge, which obviously was from the last few days or week of the water, the water high tide cutting away the sands. Into... On, the two, on the ledge where you can see the plateau where the rubbish is, that's where the, the two other tents were, one with Django and Christian and the other one. As always, pain, relief, and the impression we stay. And everything is really cool. Somewhere on this very island, the original members of Operation Jaywick watch their minds go off. It's time for the team to go in search of that very place. Let me know if I'll have to crack out your... Guys, I've got Havana's off. That, that basically means I can't do this. Really? Strong twice to me. Yes, he's wearing gloves on his hands. Idiot. This was the place? Yeah. Yeah? Perfect. It would be a head of a end of a trip, just sitting here waiting for the uh, ships to go bang. And it must have been pretty incredible for them, the, how they felt after all that work that we've just done, and we've only done a bit of it, um, to be sitting here kind of mission accomplished and watching it go bang. Obviously after this, it was their own safety, but the actual job had been done when they were up here watching it. It must have been an incredible feeling and they must have felt so relieved. All that preparation, everything all for it. So many things that could have gone wrong. And up here, they would have felt unbelievably happy, I'd imagine, and then unbelievably daunted by the task of having to get away from the bloody ships and everyone looking for them. So it was a kind of most sort of great highs and then followed by almost further fear. Um, quite impressive, really. It's probably the highlight. Relaxing <laughs> on a beach with a fire. <laughs> Yesterday, after nine hours, there were some certain thoughts about let's turn around, let's do something else. But um, yeah, obviously, I think we put a lot of planning and preparation into this, and we asked a lot of people to sort of come support us. All you know, the, the boat guys, yourselves, the film crew, as well as obviously all our friends and family who put up with us disappearing on weekends. We heard from Lions as grandson this week as well and you know again him and his dad grew up without Ivan Lyons because of what he did here yeah. you know my all my grandparents are involved in some way in the second world war and my granddad lost both his brothers in the second world war really? so it's mad like you know one generation it's still so recent I, I could have had yes yeah, well, same with all of us I'm sure but I probably would have had two other uncles growing up. 
we literally, in a couple of generations, may not be remembered. For the original members of Operation JWIC, this was only half their mission accomplished. Getting out alive was the next challenge. The journey back through heavily guarded seas to rendezvous with the Krite, who would then steer them to safety, was never taken for granted. shared four very special days with five very special guys. Thank you so much. Uh, and everything that went into it, all the support people, everything that made it come to fruition. Um, from an idea of a few beers through to four days in the water. All the members of Operation JWIC did return home safely, but they bore a terrible burden. So this was a covert operation and they could not tell anyone. They couldn't tell their families, they couldn't tell their best mates, they couldn't even tell their wives you could normally trust anything with. It must have been very, very difficult with, for them to know. Roma Page is the wife of one of the original members of Operation JWIC, Bob Page. When he came back from the first raid, uh, I met him in Sydney, and uh, and when I held his hands, they were all calloused. And I, it never occurred to me that it, it would have been from paddling. Uh, I just assumed he might have been digging somewhere. It was only after many, many, many months that did I find out exactly what he'd been doing. This silence would have tragic consequences. The Japanese were convinced that the destruction of their ships had been committed by elements of Singapore's population. The dreaded secret police were ordered to find out who. On the 10th of October, uh, now fam infamously known as the Double Ten Incident, the Japanese raided Changi Prison and took away eventually 55 civilian internees who they tortured and interrogated to find out more about the raid. Uh, they took in hundreds of Singaporeans, locals, also under interrogation. People broke under interrogation. Just to stop the pain, they would name names who were parties who were wholly innocent, and more and more people got pulled into the dragnet. And many suffered, many died, many were incarcerated for long periods because of this raid. The Australians, if they knew about it, in all likelihood would not have said anything about it because this would have put all the op military operations in Southeast Asia at risk. And um, sadly, when war takes place, uh, the cause is not just for the military, it's for lots of innocent people too. The Allies never admitted responsibility for Operation JWIC. Instead, they organized another mission to blow up more Japanese ships in Singapore Harbor the year after. This time, Ivan Lyon was not so lucky. Working under the codename Operation Rimao, Lyon and key members of his team were killed during fierce gun battles with Japanese troops. Other surviving Rimao operatives would later be captured and executed by the Japanese in Singapore in what would become known as Operation JWIC's tragic sequel. Operation JWIC means to me sacrifice, it means service, and it means legacy. The bell will be rung for the commandos who are no longer with us. There will be one ring for each commando named. Lieutenant Colonel Ivan Lyon. 
Lieutenant Commander Donald Davidson. Well, all I know is that Bob was the love of my life. Did, it can't bear to think that uh, I've got, had 70 years practically without him and never a day goes by that I don't think of him. That's how important he was.